process, and now we're going to, uh, we talked about this light cycle, and now we're going to talk about short circuiting it. All right? Well, why do we short circuit it? Let's think about this. Let's say I'm a plant that's sitting out in the sunlight all day long. This would not be a plant that exists in Oregon because this plant that I'm going to describe to you is getting too much sun. Okay? So this, if we had a plant like this in Oregon, uh, it's, it's got to be extraordinarily sensitive to sun. So a typical plant in the summertime is sitting there in the sunlight 12 or more hours a day. And it may be getting very much just blasted with the sun. If we think of that last process that I described to you, okay, the last process saw those electrons moving ultimately from water to NADP to make NADPH. Okay? Now, we have a problem in our cells, if you recall. What happens if we're not exercising in our cells to the concentration of NADH? It goes up. Okay? Electron, so, so those electrons accumulate in NADH. If we have NADH, we don't have NAD, and we can't do some of the other processes, right? We don't do citric acid cycle. We can't run those other processes. The same thing happens in plants. And plants don't have any advantage at all. They can't go out and run it off. So what happens is plants, after they're in the sunlight for a period of time, start accumulating a lot of NADPH. But well, when they accumulate a lot of NADPH, they have no NADP to donate electrons to. And if they did not have an alternative, they would waste all that energy coming from the sun. So what they do is they have a little short circuit that they do that allows the plant to continue to make ATP even though they don't have NADP. This involves a, a process that involves complex two, okay? I'm sorry, complex one, not complex two, complex one, all right? So complex one short circuits when NADPH starts running short. What happens is we see complex one gets electrons excited. It gets all, excuse me, all the way up here, but now instead of dumping those electrons off to ferrodoxin, they get passed back through this, uh, this iron sulfur carrier that's over here. So in the other scheme we saw, it went from, complex, it went from photosystem 2 to this to photosystem 1. Instead, in this system, photosystem 1 is passing electrons backwards into that iron sulfur protein. Well, the reason that's important is as the electrons pass through this guy, protons get pumped in. So this short circuit that I've just described to you allows the cell to continue to pump protons even though there's no NADP. Is it maximally efficient? No, it's not. It's going to be maximally efficient when there's NADP available. But this is much more efficient than zero, which is what would happen if it couldn't make that short circuit. Well, as a consequence, this is, and this is called cyclic photophosphorylation because it just involves these two complexes in sort of a cycle like you see here. The advantage is a proton gradient is built and ATP continues to be made. So by the end of a long day, the plant is mostly doing this. It doesn't have any NADP that's sitting around that it can't, it can't do stuff. Or that it can, that it can use. Yes? Okay, so, the, so in, in the original scheme, let me show you the original scheme. So if we go back to the original scheme, which was right um, here. Okay, in the original scheme, we saw photosystem 2 passing things off to this iron sulfur complex, which passed things off to photosystem 1. In the short circuiting, photosystem 1 is exciting electrons, but instead of passing them off this way, it passes them back here. So we see this going on in, in cyclic photophosphorylation to the iron complex. So it's just going back and forth through here. This guy isn't even involved in that process. OK? Now, as I said, the advantage is you keep making ATP in this, in this process, and the plant can store up as much ATP as it possibly can. Well, of course, there's limited amounts of ATP as well. So it's important, then, that plants use that ATP and use that NADPH as they can. And that's something that they do in the dark cycle, which can also occur in light, as I'll describe. Yes, sir? So this um, cycle, you said that happens when NAD is low or NADP is low? So the cycling happens when NADP is low. Yeah. 
So the cell will have a lot of NADPH. That means NADP concentrations will be low, and that's when this happens. Can you harvest this energy somehow? Well, the, the harvesting is largely done by what we're talking about. The harvesting is in terms of making an ADPH and making ATP. Can we do that in the lab? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Can we take chloroplasts out of cells and use chloroplasts uh, in this way? Yes, we can. But I'm not sure beyond that. What you would like to do is, I'll tell you what you'd like to do is have a solar cell, right? So you'd like to have a solar cell. To my knowledge, that's not uh, an option. Yeah. But you'd like to see those electrons going and doing something, wouldn't you? Yeah. Um, I think some of the, the more modern solar strategies actually involve you know, mimicking some of what nature already has done. But, it, but they don't use this directly, no, to my knowledge. But good, yeah, good question. Yes, Annie? I'm sorry? Photo? Photo, yes, uh-huh, yep. Yep. You bet. Okay. So um, blah, 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 blah. That's just, in, in other words, showing you the same things that I've already shown you before. So no surprises uh, there. And that's nothing we'll worry about here. Okay. Well, as I said, it's important for the cell. They don't have unlimited stores of ATP. They don't have unlimited stores of NADP. So it's important as NADPH and ATP accumulates that the cell use that energy to store that energy in another way. Well, in our body, we do that in a couple of ways. One, we store fat. Two, we store uh, carbohydrates in the form of glycogen. We can make glucose, okay? And that's what plants do. Plants make glucose with that extra energy, and that's what occurs in the dark cycle of photosynthesis. All right. Now, it's a little convoluted, and we're not going to go through all the reactions, but let me just show you what we have going on here. This is a process known as the Calvin cycle. It's named for the person who discovered it. And it traces the movement of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into ultimately glucose. No, we're not going to go through and name all the intermediates, just like we didn't name all the intermediates in the pentose phosphate pathway. The pentose phosphate pathway, however, is very similar to the Calvin cycle. Many of the uh, intermediates are similar. Many of the reactions are the same. Not all of them, but many of them are. Okay? We're going to follow through on the important reactions because I think it's essential to have a basic understanding about what happens in the Calvin cycle. Well, how does this process begin? The process begins with a, uh, an interesting sugar that has five carbons. It's called ribulose one five bisphosphate, or you might call it RU15BP, RU15BP. Ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate is a starting point for the Calvin cycle. When this molecule is combined with carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, in the presence of an enzyme, but you're going to love the name of this, Rubisco 1,5-bisphosphate carboxylase, which we're going to abbreviate as Rubisco, R-U-B-I-S-C-O. When ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate is combined with carbon dioxide in Rubisco, the molecule is uh, split into two three-carbon molecules. So we had a five-carbon, we're adding one carbon, we're making a six-carbon intermediate, which falls apart into two three-carbon molecules. And those two three-carbon molecules are known as 3-phosphoglycerate. Okay. So if I ask you on an exam the first products of the incorporation of CO2, I hope you will tell me that they are 3-phosphoglycerate. Okay. Well, you know from gluconeogenesis that 3-phosphoglycerate, which occurs in that pathway, can be converted into 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. And we start climbing the gluconeogenesis pathway. We start climbing that gluconeogenesis pathway. These processes, okay, 
require ATP and they require NADPH in plants at least. In, the, in, in our cells we used NADH but they require ATP and they require NADPH. The result of that is that those products of the light reaction are being used and they're being used to make ultimately glucose. Now there's a lot of reactions and most of these reactions are up here to balance the equation. And I don't think balancing the equation is the big picture. The big picture is we're starting with carbon dioxide and we're ultimately making glucose. If we do this reaction six times, we incorporate six carbon dioxides. And if we keep track of all the numbers, we will see that ultimately those six carbon dioxides end up making one glucose molecule. It's fairly energy intensive to do that. It takes a lot of ATP and a lot of NADPH energy, but hey, the plant's sitting there making it all the time anyway. In the light, it makes sense. So this reaction can occur in the light. It can also occur in the dark. Because in the dark, the plant that's been sitting there making ATP and NADPH all day long has plenty of stores of that sitting around that it can use in the dark. So it doesn't require light for these reactions to occur. Okay. Questions about that? All righty. We're moving right along here. There's all the reactions. You guys want to memorize all that? There's only, what, 15 reactions? And how many molecules, blah, blah, blah. The overall net is down here at the bottom. Six carbon dioxides. And no, you don't need to know these numbers. I'm just showing them to you. Six carbon dioxides. It takes 18 ATPs. It takes 12 NADPHs. And from that whole mass, we make one glucose molecule. The beauty is we're taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. We are reducing a greenhouse gas. Plants are our friends when it comes to reducing greenhouse gases because they take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and convert it into something that we can use. What do we do with carbon dioxide, with glucose? We burn it up and we make carbon dioxide. We're part of a cycle. Now don't you feel like you're important? You're actually part of a cycle. By breathing, you're contributing to global warming. Just hold your breath, right? That's all you have to do. Okay. All right. Now, yes. So, shape-loving Yeah, that's a good question. I, I I don't think it has anything to do with photosynthesis. I think it has to do with their ability to manage water. And so, shade-loving plants. I'm not a, I'm not a botanist, so don't don't quote me on this. But I believe shade-loving plants in general will have a higher water loss rate than uh, sun plants. And so, when you put them in the sun, they lose water and wilt and die very readily. Even shade-loving plants are getting indirect light, so without that, if you put them in complete darkness, a shade-loving plant would, would die. Okay. Um, there's the fixation reaction. There's ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. No, you won't have to draw that. There's carbon dioxide. There's a six-carbon intermediate that's unstable, and it falls apart to make these two molecules of 3-phosphoglycerate. Okay. Now, this enzyme is an odd enzyme. Um, it's very inefficient. And it is prone to doing side reactions that um, are not productive for the plant and cause problems for the plant in some cases. So not all of the reactions that ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate uh, catalyzes leads to glucose. So one of the, the, the ideas, and people have wrestled with this for years uh, in plants, is trying to improve the efficiency of ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate to improve the efficiency with which plants harvest light energy from the sun. And um, you'll see it's, it's not a trivial problem. Some people think that the inefficiency of the enzyme actually is good for the plant and helps the plant to survive. Uh, but uh, let's see, what I, here's what I wanted. The problem is that ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate can react with oxygen in addition to reacting with carbon dioxide. So if carbon dioxide concentrations are low for whatever reason, oxygen may uh, play a role. And when that